Good morning. We are going to do chapter eight, potential energy and conservation of energy. <clears throat> so let's start with the question, what is potential energy? Um, so energy is always a little bit tricky because it's somewhat abstract. You and, and potential energy is a form, you're, you're, it's something that holds the capacity to get, to get something moving but it's not actually doing it, um, at least at that point. So here you can see if you have a, a football that's being kicked to someone else, um, at the kick, the kicker does work that gives it kinet kinetic energy um, and it's close to the ground. So here you have very little potential energy. As it travels up, the kinetic energy decreases with the potential energy increases. At the highest point, the kinetic energy is at its maximum, potential energy is at its minimum. It's not, if you were just throwing something all the way up, it would be, uh, it would, the velocity in the y direction is zero right here, but, um, but there is some x component. Okay. As the ball descends, kinetic energy um, increases again, and then potential energy decreases. And then here you're back to roughly the um, same distribution you had there. Um, so you're looking at the conversion of this kinetic energy from the kick to potential energy as the ball goes through its trajectory. Um, here you have a different case. A, a bungee jumper transforms the gravitational potential energy because they're on a bridge or something at the very beginning into elastic potential energy at the bottom because at the bottom they also stop. So we'll work with springs a little bit and there you have a different form of elastic potential energy from the spring and the bungee cord is a lot like um, is a lot like uh, um, is a lot like a spring so you know you'll you'll be working mostly with gravitational potential energy um, we will just consider distance from the surface of the earth um, and as you go if you're walking along and you go up a hill you go up in potential energy and then you can go back down Okay, so we mentioned um, springs. Springs have potential energy too. So when you when you compress the spring, you have potential energy. So when the spring is going to go oscillate back and forth, when it is compressed and stopped, you are at you have entirely potential energy, no kinetic energy. But then also when it stretches and it reaches the bottom, it has entirely potential energy and no kinetic energy. Um, and you, the, you know, here in this case, you have the spring hanging from um, hanging from the wall. So you have some equilibrium position. You pull it here. You have some potential energy as it goes up. It converts it into um, kinetic energy. It goes up and more and converts that kinetic energy back into potential energy. And then it comes down. It's converting it into kinetic energy again and then back into potential energy. So you end up with this oscillation. Okay, conservative versus non-conservative forces. Um, whenever we're working with um, conservative forces, everything's easy. The amount of energy, the amount of mechanical energy in the system stays constant. Whenever we have non-conservative forces, the amount of um, the amount of mechanical energy is going to decrease. This is usually because you're converting. You're using forces such as friction and air resistance to convert some of the mechanical energy, which is both kinetic and potential, into, um, into thermal energy. So here, this is if you have a, a particle that is moving around in some potential um, and everything is conservative, you might have initially you have all potential energy. So this is your total energy, this is your potential energy, this is your kinetic energy. Um, if you're thinking, for instance, about the mass on the spring, when we don't consider losses, at some point you have all potential energy, you can redistribute that energy between um, potential and kinetic, but the total amount of energy is going to be, stay the same. So this might be um, what you have when you're part of the way between one of the end positions 
and the equilibrium position. And then here you have everything in kinetic energy. So when you have these conservative forces, you can just redistribute and move the energy around. Here you have a simple pen pendulum. Um, for a simple pendulum, um, you are, as, as the mass moves up, you are converting the, um, so here you have all kinetic energy, or well, depends on where you set your zero. Um, so here, most of your energy is in um, potential, is in kinetic energy. You have the maximum kinetic energy. As you move up, you're going to reach a point where you have um, no more kinetic energy left. It will stop and it will go back down um, and it will oscillate between these two points. And we will talk about this oscillatory motion, this oscillatory motion in a different chapter. Okay, here's an example of a non-conservative force. You have a grinding wheel to smooth, um, to smooth some metal out, and it's doing a non-conservative force because the amount of work done depends on how many rotations the, the wheel makes, so it's path dependent. But you also know this because if you touch whatever it's grinding, you will feel it going, the temperature going up. Um, a helicopter loses a panel that falls until it reaches its terminal velocity. How much um, did air resistance contribute to the dissipation of energy in this problem? Um, okay, so here, air resistance is our non-conservative force. Um, you have some um, potential energy and it, the potential is highest when this panel is as high as it is, is where it starts. The um, the potential energy decreases until it reaches the bottom. Um, and at the bottom, the kinetic energy is maximum. And if you wanted to know how much energy you had actually lost, you would draw, you would add together this kinetic energy and the potential energy. And everything that is left is the energy that is lost in that. Um, in that process from air resistance. Presumably air resistance, you're just going to assume it was all lost to air resistance. Okay, types of different potential energy. Um, one of the easiest to work with is gravitational potential energy. And this particular form um, is for things near the surface of the earth. Um, when we cover gravitation, we're gonna cover the more complicated form um, for when you're far away from the center of the earth um, or where, you're, where your heights are changing significantly. Um, mostly we're talking about meters, not kilometers um, of height. Um, so, your gravitational potential energy near the surface of the Earth is, um, again, remember for any, you know, if you want to calculate the amount of work that, done by some force, you're looking at force, the dot product of force with the distance, um, with the distance traveled, and your dot, and you are um, doing an integral if you have enough. Um, path that you have to cover. So the force here is mg, the gravitational potential, or is it the gravitational force, and then multiplied by the height that you travel, because we're treating the gravitational force as constant near the surface of the Earth. And this is why when you deal with um, very, when you're dealing with things where the height travel, the height varies significantly, you actually have to, um, you have to do the integral instead of just using MGY. So this is one that we're going to use a lot, gravitational potential energy. It's great for um, illustrating a lot of simple concepts. And then the potential from the pot potential energy from a spring. So um, here, again, we're going to integrate our force is proportional to x, and then we integrate with respect to x. 
So that is why the spring potential energy takes the form of one half kx squared. Now, <clears throat> most of you are concurrently taking calculus. Um, so you might not yet be to where you're doing integrals, but you can take the derivative and see that you get back to something that looks like the, the force. Um, so the force of a spring is a spr the spring constant times the displacement. You can take the derivative of this guy right here and you get back to what you had before. So for a spring, um, you're always working with one half kx squared um, for your potential energy. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is a really important example. Um, so then when you are at your equilibrium point, note that this x, we often just say x squared, but um, that x is actually the distance from the equilibrium position. So I harp on coordinate systems all the time. If you are doing a problem where you have not put your coordinate system at the equilibrium position, you actually have to be a little bit more careful with this. And your potential is one half K X minus the equilibrium position quantity squared. You're looking at the difference between X and the equilibrium position. Um, so then what you see is this behavior where it's the potential looks sort of like a bowl, looks parabolic. So um, the further you get away from the equilibrium position, the larger the potential energy. And that is what you, um, what leads to some of this oscillatory um, behavior. So here you can see if you have some total amount of energy, you, um, as, as something moves back and forth in this potential, you're converting your um, kinetic energy into potential energy. Your turning points will be at the point where all of your energy is potential energy. Um, and your equilibrium point will be where your kinetic energy is at a maximum. Um, now, when I was in intro physics, I remember sitting there going, why do I care about a mass on a spring? This is just such a very specific example. And most problems aren't really like that. So why am I going to care about a mass on a spring? Now, the reason why you care is because this is actually a really, really useful example. And, and most of the time, when we have something in equilibrium, it turns out that you can approximate nearly all bound systems as approximately a mass on a spring. Um, so I'm going to get a little mathy here for a second. For those of you who have gotten through calculus, you've seen a Taylor series. And with a Taylor series, what you do is that you're, you say that you can take any function with some mathy caveats that it has to be smooth and nice and whatnot. Um, you can take any function and you can always describe it as a sum of the form, a, con the, a constant plus some constant times x plus some constant times x squared. Uh -huh. When you have um, a bound state like this, you have some minimum in your potential you can always describe your potential. You expand it about the equilibrium point and you have a constant offset. And then you can, when at the equilibrium point, the, um, at the equilibrium point, your first derivative is zero. So that first term is, that, that X term is zero. So then you have a term of the form some constant times x squared. So you can always take any potential and describe that it, that has a bound state and describe it as approximately a parabola, and therefore you have something which is approximately a mass on a spring. And this holds for 
atoms found um, in molecules and in, uh, in solids. It holds, it holds for basically any bound state. Um, and a lot of contemporary physics research is taking that first order approximation where you say, oh, I'm gonna call it a mass on a spring getting more and more refined uh, estimates of what's going on there, um, either through clever calculation techniques or through, um, or through numerical methods. So life is just a mass on a spring. So this problem seems at first like it's some abstract thing we're doing in intro physics, but it is one of the most consequential physical problems that you will actually see. Um, because everything can be described as a mass on a spring. So do not do what I did. Take this seriously. This is a really important and cool example. Because what, what we do, you don't do this in intro physics so much, but what we do in physics is that we're trying to take the world and make mathematical approximations of the world. And we're trying to do it in and we're making mathematical approximations of the world, but we're using things we know how to solve. We know how to solve a mass on a spring. So that's what we start with. If we can get everything set up to be, so we, we can describe it as a mass on a spring, we're good. We know how to move from there. Um, all right, so here's an arbitrary potential. Um, and then in this case, um, what, so, you can always add a whole bunch of potential energies and get all sorts of different shapes or you actually have some complicated um, physical situation. If you can describe its potential, you can start talking about the behavior of the system. So um, here you can, here this is some funny potential system. So, um, you can draw any particular level. Um, if I have, uh, let me draw here. If this is my total amount of energy, then if I have some particle, it has to be either stuck here or stuck there until we get to quantum mechanics, but we're gonna skip that right now. Quantum mechanics has, has weird things, but we'll talk about them yet. Okay, and then if you go here, Let's say you can think about this when you have these potentials. Um, the way I always visualize it is think about a marble rolling in a bowl. So your marble starts here. It has the maximum potential. It's going to roll down that, roll down the edge of the bowl. And it's going to go up and it slows down, but it doesn't stop because it's still got a little bit of kinetic energy left right here. Um, and then it goes back down. Ooh, I think the marble in a bowl, um, the marble in the bowl analogy helps me a lot. Okay, a few examples, and I am doing this cold, so bear with me, you're seeing the actual thought process. It's early in the morning right now. Okay, so this is a common um, de physics demonstration. Um, you take a bowling ball suspended from the ceiling and um, you pull it up to yourself. So right until it touches your nose, you release it and it swings and then it comes back and it's never going to actually hit your face. Now, your instinct as a human being is to flinch because this bowling ball is headed towards your face but it will never hit your face because, um, because of the total amount of energy. So when you, when you are at this point and you're releasing the bowling ball, um, you have all of the energy and potential energy. And even though it speeds up as you let it go and it goes back um, and it's flying towards your face, it's never ever gonna actually hit it because there's not enough kinetic energy. Now, a student goes and pushes it at the bottom so it speeds up, all bets are off. Um, although then you're probably gonna give it a little bit of velocity so it could actually 
go next to the professor. But what this shows is that um, that you're just converting energy between potential and kinetic, and you you never will get enough energy unless you have some vengeful student come in and, and push it, you're not gonna get enough energy to actually hit the professor in the face. Okay, here I've done, I've taken some of the problems from the book and I wanna be careful not to do exactly the problem and I'm gonna set them up and not actually do them in most cases. Um, <clears throat> I might change the numbers and muck, sometimes I mucked it around a little bit on purpose. A man is skiing across level ground at a speed uh, it's at some speed when he comes to a hill of a small slope. Um, and if the ski skier coasts up the hill, what is his speed when he reaches the top plateau? Assume friction between the skis is negligible. Okay, so coasting means that he is not changing um, any of his, um, he is not changing his, um, his kinetic energy. So what we're going to do is a problem strategy. When you're using energy conservation, um, you are going to write the initial energy equals the kinetic energy. So um, we are always going to do initial energy or initial energy equals final energy. Um, so initially we have some kinetic energy and um, we actually we are always going to have we can write initial energy uh, equals poten initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy final energy equals initial final kinetic energy plus final um, potential energy um, and in this case the initial kinetic energy is zero uh, or initial potential energy is zero. We're just gonna set our zero here because I get to choose arbitrarily. So I am going to be a, a good physicist as a lazy physicist. I am going to choose the answer, which means that I have less work to do. I am going to call this Y and this X. Um, and then um, my Y here is zero, so my potential is mg times zero right there, and here it is mg times h, where I'm going to call this h. Okay, so then I can plug numbers in here, and I have one half m, because the skier's mass doesn't change, V initial squared equals one half M V final squared plus M G H. And I can solve this um, and get, well, if I want to actually solve this for the final velocity, the first thing I'm going to do is, is cross out all the m's because they're in every term, multiply by 2, and I get v final equals v, the square root of v initial squared plus 2gh. So that is my answer for a. Notice, which many of you are still not doing, I'm keeping everything as symbols. I'm keeping everything as symbols because it's a lot easier to plug everything in later. Okay, and, and what you will see is that physics professors tend to keep everything as symbols. Beginning students tend to put numbers in, um, and you can put numbers in too quickly. Um, if you, and it, it's then you're prone to make mistakes. Um, what you can do here, looking at this number, so obviously, oh, I meant to do the spotlight. Velocity has the un same units as the square root of velocity. GH, let me look at the units here for GH. GH has units of meters 
per second squared times meters, and then I'm taking the square root of it, that indeed has the same units as velocity. So that's good. Okay, because I know if I have the right units, I might have the right answer. If I have the wrong units, I know I have the wrong answer. All right, so now in part B, it says, what if it, you know, what if he has friction acting on the skis? Now here, we're gonna add some, oh, I wanted to change colors. I don't wanna use blue. Um, I'm gonna use green. We're gonna add some work due to friction. And our work, so here we have our familiar block on an inclined plane. And you get that the magnitude of friction is mu kinetic times the normal force, which is mg. And um, then a, I'm just doing in my head real quickly whether I want sine or cosine. Friction is larger. Let's see, norm, yeah, the friction is going to be, the normal force is larger if the angle is zero. So I want a cosine, mg cosine theta. Um, so that if the, um, if the slope were flat, we're going to have the maximum normal force. Okay, so friction is mu k, mu k mg cosine theta. So our total work here, we're going to add mu k g cosine theta times, let me call this L. And I'm gonna put the L there so it doesn't look like an argument of the cosine. So that's my total amount of, and I've dropped my M. And that's my total amount of friction. I will have the M term there. Um, so then I do the same. So that's how much energy, how much work has gone into friction. The energy is energy is still conserved. So that's why I put it over here. It's in the final in the final energy. There is just some energy that went into the work done by friction. And then when I um, go to write my answer. I have V initial equals the square root of V final squared plus two G H plus two L mu K G cosine theta. So that's how I'm taking into account friction. Now that will work when you can count, you can calculate the amount of energy that you lost through some non-conservative force, but there's a lot of cases when you cannot. So often when we have um, non-conservative forces and we have some energy loss, you, you can't use energy conservation. All right, the next problem. A small block of mass M slides without friction um, around the loop-the-loop -loop apparatus shown below. If the block starts from rest at A, what is its speed at B? And what is the force of the track on the block at B? Okay, so hang on just a second. I'm gonna check one thing. Yes, we are recording. Oop. Okay. So here we are not working. Um, we are not worried about. Um, we are not worried at all about non conservative forces. So this is easy. Um, if this is a radius of R, this is not drawn to scale, 
<laughs> and this is a height of 2r. So for the first part, um, we are going to write, again, initial, can it initial energy is initial potential energy plus initial kinetic energy, and that equals final potential energy plus Final, uh, final kinetic energy plus, I have said the wrong thing. I've said the right thing, but written the wrong thing. The initial energy equals the final energy. So I'm gonna do my subscripts here. All right, now I can also write this that, um, so I can say this is M G Y initial plus one half um, V initial squared equals M G Y final plus one half M V final squared. Often, almost all the time when I am doing um, conservation of energy problems, my M's are going to totally cancel out. Um, so I can do that. And then I am after the speed at B, which is V final. So I can solve this. And here I can write G. Uh, we're going to we're going to solve for G for V final. I'm going to multiply through by two everywhere. So I'm going to do twos. Cancel out the one halves. And I get V final. Ah, I have to move my little toolbar. V final squared equals V initial squared. Oh, I did, I could have done one more quick thing. We are starting at rest. So this guy is zero and I can drop that term right away. So V final squared is equal to Two G times Y initial minus Y final and take the square root of all of that. So it's going to be equal to two G times two R. Actually, I can move the two out of the square root. Two times because I had a four, so square two times the square root of gr. Okay, the second part of the question asked, what is the force at that point? Now I know that the minimum force has to be um, what's going to keep it in circular motion. So I can say for circular motion. V squared So it's moving in it's moving circularly so V squared over R has to equal the acceleration um, and the force due to gravity at that point Is, so the force is going to be G. So if the minimum force um, so this is this would give you a velocity that is if you were at the very the very slowest speed to stay on the roof on the on the loop, your force is going to be the square root of G times R. So 
if you are twice that, then um, to stay on the loop, you have to have half of your um, force come from uh, come from the track on the block. So the force of the track on the block has to be G so that you get um, so that you um, the, so that the block is still moving in a circle. Okay, next problem. A skier with an initial speed of V0 coasts up a height, a, a um, here I have gone in and changed some of the numbers. So this is, or I should actually call this V initial, coasts up an H high rise as shown. Find her final speed at the top, given that the coefficient of friction between her skis and the snow is mu k. So this is very similar to the one we did a few slides back. The initial kinetic energy is one half m v initial squared. We are going to, the initial potential energy, we're gonna set our zero at the ground again. So we have no initial potential energy. The, we have a final energy one half m the final squared. Um, the potential energy is MGH. And then here, we're going to have the same form. Our friction is mu k m g cosine theta. Um, and here, we need to figure out what L is. So we're given the height. Um, and L sine theta is going to equal H. So A L is H over sine theta. So then our total work due to friction is going to be our friction force times the distance traveled. So we have mu k m g h and then times cotangent of theta because I have cosine divided by sine. So now I have mu k m g h cotangent theta. Boom, 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 boom. Multiply by two. And now I can solve for um, the final velocity. Mm, don't want to do the final velocity is equal to the square root of the initial velocity squared minus two g h minus two mu k g h o tangent theta. Okay, so let me give you some of the pitfalls of this. So I have just done this entirely symbolically. And then I'm going to plug some numbers in. And when I plug numbers in, it is mathematically possible to get a negative number in the argument of the cosine or of the square root. If you get a negative number here, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you follow your numbers blindly. What it means is that this part was larger than this part. Um, so that can happen. That's happening because either the slope is too high, the skier didn't have enough kinetic energy to get all the way up the slope anyways, or friction was too much. The skier, well, still, the skier didn't have enough kinetic energy to get all the way up the slope. So 
if you see a number, you guys are physicists. If you see a number that does not make sense, you don't just chug on through, you stop and you think about what it means. Why does that number not make sense? Where is it coming from? All right. This one can be a little bit easier. What is the initial gravitational potential energy of the system and what is the final gravitational potential potential gravitational or sorry, bleh, bleh. what is the initial gravitational potential of the energy of the system and what is the final kinetic energy of the system all right there's a lot of things this particular problem um which i trimmed because i don't want to put the solutions to a textbook online um did give you a coordinate system the obvious coordinate system is our standard coordinate system with x along the, the ground and y perpendicular to the ground. Now you need to know the height at the centers of mass. So we're gonna, if we have this where, and actually this problem set made some assumptions about the relative masses. I think M1 was way, way larger. No, M2 has to be larger if it's gonna fall. Um, okay. Let's call the, let's say both masses are at a height h. So if both masses are at a height h, your initial um, potential energy is going to be the sum of the potential energies of those two. So m2 g h. Um, and let's see. The final kinetic energy, well, here, this one's a little bit tricky because here you have the initial potential energy and that the system starts at rest has to equal the final potential energy plus, now these two blocks have to move at the same speed so one half, they're coupled together, M1 plus M2 V final squared. Um, really, because all it asks for is the final kinetic energy, you want to know how much kinetic energy you lose. So this is a geometry problem. This, you have to know the height of the, so in the final situation, in the final system, that block M2 is going to be all the way at the bottom. So you have no potential energy from block two, but at that point, let me actually change colors here. And I'm going to draw the final system. Drawings are your friend when you're doing physics problems. If you don't have a good drawing, you're not going to know what's going on in the problem. Okay, so here's M2, and it has traveled a different distance h. And M1 has gone a distance h up, but it's going up the slope. So it's not increasing its total height. So now, you have, you have to know how much this is. So the height, the change in height is going to be H and then here, cosine theta. So the final kinetic energy um, is going to be the initial potential energy minus the final potential energy, which is M1 plus M2 GH minus M1 G 
H cosine theta. Okay, so what I want you to notice about this is that this is just problem solving. You're slowly churning through, you're, you're doing a logic problem. You set up everything you know. And so that's why when we guide you through how to solve these problems, you start by writing down the stuff you know. Um, and you have the benefit here that you know what type of problem it is, that this is, a, this is an energy problem, so you're gonna solve it using conservation of energy. So you know, okay, if you have conservation of energy, this is gonna be your toolkit. And then you slowly work through and make logical conclusions about the problem until you see how you can get the answer to fall out. Um, when you've done hundreds of these problems, you will look at the problem and you will say, oh, of course this is how you have to do it. You have to use energy conservation. You have to, you have to draw a force diagram. When you've done a lot of them, you're gonna see what the right approach is for solving them. But it only comes with practice. And as my quantum mechanics teacher told me many, many years ago, you have to hurt to learn. Okay, so with that, we're gonna stop this chapter and we'll see you for the next one.